may fright fiends, desire like the gore lord, gods of some, devil to others, but a film buff to all. I know it's been a good while since I've come up to the land of the mortals, but you see, I've, uh, I've been a rather naughty little devil and had to spend some time atoning for my bad deeds. My sentence? Eight months of 80s music whilst being locked inside a shopping mall. It wasn't pretty. And you know, this has me remembering an old 80s slash tastic cult classic. Join me now as I take a look at the 1986 techno slaughter known as Shopping Mall. Shopping Mall is a 1986 sci-fi horror comedy co-written and directed by exploitation veteran Jim Wynorski and stars Kelly Maroney, Tony O'Dell, Russell Todd, Carrie Emerson, Nick Seagal, Susie Slater, a young Sean Hannity, I, I mean John Teleski, and horror legend Barbara Crampton. The film opens up with a discount Michael Bean committing a jewelry heist set to 1980s Terminator-style music. Only he isn't being pursued by a Terminator. He's being pursued by... Who's Johnny? Johnny Five? The would-be Kyle Reese gives chase, but there won't be any jewelry for the Sarah Connor in his life. <laughs> Only this is nothing more than a demonstration. In a mall where Securetronics Unlimited is unveiling their new top-of-the-line security system, the Protector 101 series. And after some daft questions and bad acting, we're treated to a mid-80s excess extravaganza for an opening credit sequence, where we learn that elevators might come into play, that Coke was it, and that by it, I mean taking product placement to a level that would make Gene Simmons smile. And that... Somebody's an ass man. Next, we meet our main characters, Allison and Susie, who work for this man, who when not smoking over his food, apparently spends at least some of his time wiping his ass with his t-shirt. I mean, I understand that being a crook is well, a bit of a messy job, but tell me, mortals, would you want to eat something made by this man? While the girls conspire about after work plans, a storm seems to come out of nowhere and strikes one of the control boxes, governing the protectors. The alarms sound, and the technician starts randomly flipping switches and pushing buttons, until the alarm stops, and instead of getting on the phone with his company, he decides to, well, check out the latest centerfold, much to the chagrin of the protectors. We next meet another chunk of the cast, starting with Ferdy, Greg, and Mike Brennan, who've put together a little <clears throat> meat mash of sorts in the department store they work in. It turns out that since everyone has a girlfriend but Ferdy, he and Allison have essentially been set up on a blind date together. We also get to meet Rick, who can't seem to fix his truck, and his lady, Linda, who can fix it one-handed in a matter of seconds. We also meet Brennan's lady, Leslie, when he shows up at the store she works in, hoping to get a little action. Only her voyeur of a daddy has been monitoring their little PDA and subsequently eavesdrops into their conversation about the post-work rendezvous. Not that her creepy father ever factors back into the story, nor has anything to do with the plot, 
but in just introducing the main characters. The mall soon closes and another technician comes into the control room, reading a book, and notices that, uh, well, his partner is gone. The little reader quickly becomes a pain in the neck, but the party has started, uh, showing us that these kids are rearing to go, that the cameraman isn't the only ass-obsessed person on the set, and that upon Ferdy and Allison meeting, the 80s strikes again. Allison Parks. Hi. Hi. The heat in the air becomes contagious, and with them all closed and uh, the Protector One on patrol, it's time for the three out of four couples to well, have sex in the same room, where Leslie seems to have forgotten that just the week before, she let him slip his taste tester into the unholiest of holies. This leaves Faraday and Allison watching old horror movies at the edge of the room. While the little meat mash commences upstairs, we are treated to a cameo by the great Dick Miller, who talks to the interrupting robot the way most mortals talk to their cell phones. Look what you did! I ought to turn you into scrap metal for this! Only the protector isn't one to be threatened, and decides it's time to pull out his probe and crank up the voltage. Meanwhile, Leslie's nicotine addiction gets the best of her, and Brennan soon realizes that the only way to get her mind off the cancer stick and back onto his prick is to run downstairs and fetch her a pack of smokes from the vending machine. But the only thing getting smoked at that point is him. Leslie soon adjourns downstairs to find him, and oh yes, more amazing cinematography. Ah, oh, but she and her sculpture-worthy posterior are then penetrated with sex toy-sized lasers, and uh, it is then that she meets the wrath of the robo-slasher. Joined by Protector 2, the robots see the others bearing witness to the massacre, and they charge after in pursuit. They then proceed to light the place the fuck up, blowing up every last thing inside, but the kids who flee into a storage room. Wait, where have I seen this before? They take to the air duct in terror, but... I can't stand this anymore. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here! Ducks are a bitch. While Susie has a claustrophobic meltdown, we are treated to some 80s synth music while the fellas find themselves away into the sporting goods store. Their ode to Roger, Peter, and Flyboy complete, they move back into the mall to combat the gore-spewing gizmos. While Allison plays therapist for Susie, the boys take down the first offender and are soon after working their way to the elevator. Well... They get to me. Meanwhile, the ladies have met back up and are grabbing cans of gas, flares, and other improvised weapons to take to the fight. And they're going to need them too. The fellas may be trying to rig the elevator, but like many good horror killers, the Protector 1 is back online. Protector 2 is on the move, and shit's about to get real. Even though the Protectors can't shoot their dildo lasers worth a damn, they do a mean impersonation of the Elm Street parents. They run, and soon find themselves watching on as Rick sets some tanks and goes all John Matrix. With Rick in the clear, they open fire, giving Protector 2 the same end Spielberg gave Bruce the shark. 
They take refuge in the poop shirt pizzeria, and after much debate, Ferdy decides it might be best to find and destroy the lightning fried computer. And they're off. Only Greg gets treated like a bad match on Tinder and gets swiped aside into eternal rest. They run on, prying open the steel security door to a department store. But the bots are closing in. Will the rest of the young lovers survive? Who might meet their grisly doom? Will there be any more explosions or gratuitous ass shots? This film's saving grace is that it doesn't try to be anything more than it is. Yes, there is enough 80s cheese in this one to fill an entire shopping mall. But the film is smart in its self-aware ways. The effects are dated, the acting is nothing to write home about, but the story itself is strong. And once the action gets going, it does not let up for long. Is this one amongst my favorites? No. But it is well worth a watch, and showcases everything that was both great and terrible about the 1980s. I give this techno-charged, action-packed cult classic two and a half out of five gratuitous ass shots. My thanks to those of you mortals who have supported me in launching this channel. As it grows, there will be so much wicked fun to be had. Continue to spread the word, telling all the real horror fans you know to step into the darkness and know that this kindly old devil salutes you. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, toll the bell, and leave your comments below. I'm Relic the Ghoul Lord. I'm back, motherfuckers, and I'll be seeing you all sooner or later. Stop. 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 Stop.